It is adjusted. It is adjusted. Or number of times. The screen is also visible, right? Podium and yes. A very good morning to one and all present here. I, Pranati, pursuing my master's first year in clinical nutrition, welcome you all to the national level invited lecture on nutrigenomics organized by the Department of Nutrition. Without any delay, I'd like to start the proceedings of the lecture by a quote of Buddha. Health is the greatest gift, contentment the greatest wealth, faithfulness the best relationship. Let's all pray to God for giving us a healthy body, mind, and soul. Prayer is a place of admitting our need, of adopting humility, and claiming dependence upon God. It's an expansion of total faith in the power present within and around us. Prayer is an exercise of hope. He fulfills our desires if we call upon him and acknowledge him every time, particularly at the beginning of every work. I request everyone to rise for the same. Proverbs chapter 4, verse 5, 8. Get wisdom, get understanding. Forget it not, neither decline from the words of my mouth. Forsake her not, and she shall preserve thee. Love her, and she shall keep thee. Wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom. And with all the getting, get understanding. You may please sit now. I now request Ms. Sindhu Ashwin ma'am to place the dials. As per the tradition of our institution, we would like to welcome the guest speaker with the green greetings. I now request Dr. Paro Chaudhary Ma'am, Assistant Professor, Department of Nutrition, to present the green greetings to the guest of the day. Aisha Rabbani of MSc First Year Clinical Nutrition to introduce the guest speaker for today's session. A very warm good morning to one and all. Good morning, Ma. Uh, I'm honored to give an uh, introduction of our honorable guest, uh, Ms. Sindhu Ashman. 
She is uh, the head of nutrition in One Health Hyderabad, and she is also a nutrigenomics expert. Ma'am has done her Master's of Science uh, in Food and Nutrition and Bachelor's of Science in Food and Nutrition the same from Bangalore University. Ma'am has been practicing nutrigenomics specializing in gut health and research. She has 12 years of experience in end-to-end -end food product development, life cycle in food and nutri uh, nutrition domain. She is also an expert in consulting, including uh, building startups, lifestyle uh, lifestyle counseling and food auditing she has also qualified in quality checks cause analysis correct corrective actions and continuous improvement she has also developed personalized nutritional plans integrating uh, gut health genetics for new product creation besides she has also collaborated with neverpoint health which is in hyderabad uh, focusing on metabolic and autoimmune disorder research uh, led a team of nutritionists ensuring work com competition adhered to quality norms. She has also worked as nutrition manager and product curator at Neverpoint Health from August 2020 uh, uh, to uh, August 2023. Ma'am has also previously served as nutrition manager at Linspoon Hyderabad from February 2016 to September 2019. And uh, she has also been a senior nutritionist and trust work in Bengaluru, that is from June 2011 to June 2015. She also holds certifications in gut microbiome exploration, uh, lead author training, and diabetic educator as well. She has conceptualized wellness tools and collaborated with the IT team for content development. She has managed key aspects of weight and cholesterol management hypertension, gout, and diabetes. She has published papers in the International Journal of Nutrition, Pharmacology, and uh, Neurological Diseases on Gut Microbiome-Based Dietary Intervention in Parkinson's Disease Subject, which is a case report. Thank you. Thank you, Aisha. Without further delay, I now request our guest speaker, Ms. Sindhu Ashwin, ma'am, to start the session. Hello, everyone. Uh, Aisha, thank you. I think uh, <laughs> I should be able to help all of you to move forward uh, with having all of this. Um, So, uh, Aisha has already introduced me, but I would like to give you a small introduction. Um, so, I'm Sindhu, and uh, I mainly work on research and try to help people to get over their um, general health needs. But I will get to Pranati. As you know, when Pranati initially started with the talk, she started with one thing we should pray God that we have a healthy body and a healthy mind. I think that is one thing that I tell all my clients. Pray for what you have currently and then aim for something that, that is really far. You know, having a great body or anything is very important, definitely. But having a sound mind and being happy about what we all have is equally important. So with this, let me start the session. Okay, so I think this is the most simple thing. All of us are definitely excited. That is why we all are here. We know what is nutrition. So according to me, you know, nutrition is a very simple thing. It's like a, it's like a mode from one place to another, like the way we have a transportation. Nutrition is basically a barrier that is going to help our body and mind to keep healthy. We have different terminologies here, uh, you know, I've just mentioned a few. Basically, they give you nourishment, balanced health, everything. But it is basically a barrier that is going to help us to stay healthy and stay happy. I can, I can 
and here, right? Okay, sure. So, now why did we even get into nutrigenomics? Okay, that, that is something that we need to understand. Uh, now, nutrition, was, was nutrition not enough? Or why did we even end up at nutrigenomics? Now, the first thing is, when we, whenever we were talking about, you know, solving a problem, obesity, diabetes, or uh, cholesterol management, or anything, we had few cases, or even, you know, when nutrigenomics were found, they had few cases that could not be solved. Okay, they did not know why, you know, in spite of right kind of diet, physical activity, and everything, still the problem was not solved. That is when they started digging into what can be the reason that they have ended up in this stage. And that is when nutrigenomics came up. Basically, the genomics uh, word started, that is how it was started. So, so as I said, the post-genomic area is where we all are. We look at the genetic as an important factor to correct our present. Can you go to the next slide? Okay. Now, Human Genome Project was started for this. So, basically, samples from all over the world was taken. So, what we study, uh, you know, today when you open, when you just go search about obesity or diabetes or even gut health, the first thing that we see is based on uh, this kind of uh, background, the diabetes is high. Based on this kind of factor, the obesity was high. So, that is how a Human Genome Project was created right now. The biggest project that is going on is the human gut project, similar to the human genome project. The gut project has just started, you know, four, five years ago. The genome project started around 15 years ago. So in the genome, can you go back? Yeah, in the genome project, they were looking at the gene expressions, how each gene behaved. So they took a sample size of 50 and their family. And if and if the elders were alive, they even took them. And they were in the research for almost 25 years. So from a young age till they were 25. And people who were 25, 30 till they were 50, 60. So the whole study was done based on how the gene expression would change. But there was one surprise that the Human Genome Project did not expect. Now, for example, we Indians, we go live in the US. okay, And for all, almost 20 years, our gene expression will change. So that is something the genome project did not expect. That was a slight hiccup that they had. So that is when they tackled it in the next stage. Can you move to the next one? So this is what, you know, they basically came up with. Now there is, they came up with something called genomics and they realized that the, to change the genomics, nutrition is a very important factor. Even to change the genetic expression, food is something that will play a major role. But along with food, these are all things that we've already, you know, you've been studying this, okay? How each, uh, you know, nutrition bioactive compounds, how they transcript to your phenotype. But then, uh, based on this, I want to get into the epigenomics. Go to the next slide. Yeah. So now, after this, what they did is they realized one thing. 99% of the genetic factor is same. Of if you take a family, their 99% of their genetic factor is same. Only 1% was the difference. And that is how they were able to tell that, you know, somebody is prone to certain cancers. Somebody is prone to certain weird diseases. For example, most of the skin diseases today might skip 2-3 generations. But it has come to the 4th generation. Now they are able to track it. Eczema, for example, it is a classic case of a genome project. Because eczema skipped almost two generations and it came to the fourth generation. So they were not able to track it till they went back to four generations behind. And that is when they realized that, you know, 99% of genetic factors are same. Now I think this is something uh, that, you know, all of you might have to pay attention to. Because along with genomics, and nutrigenomics, epigenomics is something very important because a person's complete nutrition uh, and the whole life cycle is completely changed when a person is living in a totally different environment and his physical activity. So based on, uh, you know, is there a problem there? No, everything is fine. 
Okay. It's a short circuit, okay. We need to pick it. I can continue? Yes. Okay, I hope they're fine. Okay, so I think epigenomics is something that we all have to pay attention to. One is nutrition, second is their lifestyle, third is the environment that they are living, that they are currently living. So the epigenomics will play a major role when a person is living in a particular place for 20 years, his genetic is bound to change. His genetic factors from what he got from his parents, from his grandparents, will change. So that means some of the disorders is skipped his generation and it will move on to, it, it will be a not a dominant gene, it will be a resistant gene and that will go to the next two generations. So that is something we have to take care of as nutritionists. Can you go to the next one? Now, now, what did the Human Genome Project do? Okay. Now, uh, you, you can note down this, but later I can also send it to your teachers. There is a whole list of, uh, you know, gene symbol and a gene name created and for what it is used for. Okay. <laughs> now, there are multiple genes that was there. Now, based on that ADIPOQ, for example, it is for adipocyte. Now, that is where most of the fat cells are created. Now, assume that, you know, you are treating a diabetic person and, and he's also obese. Now, that is where, you know, we look at these gene factors. Now, FTO, a very important gene. Now, any genetic company, when they get the test done, FTO is the first gene that they get to test it for. That is for testing your fat mass obesity associated gene. Now, when somebody is obese, First, we categorize them about what kind of obesity do they have. Now, this is basically looking at their fat mass as such. So, their hip area, their stomach area, and that is where most of the fat is deposited. Along with that, we check the adipocyte tissue. And then, we also look at leptin. So, in all of these factors are given in certain way. For example, leptin high, moderate, low, how much of leptin is actually produced to this person. Now, based on that, based on the leptin, we actually give the nutrients and based on that, the food list is created. Now, for each one of these factors, for example, a very important factor here is MC, um, MC4R. So, where, you know, alpha melanin cells, you know, hormone stimulation happens. Now, in this particular case, what happened? Hormonally, the the person is prone to be obese. So how do you treat that person? When there is a FTO gene or even leptin gene, you know, a diet and exercise can play a very major factor. But when it is coming to a hormonal issue, the, the whole dialysis, I mean the whole, I'm sorry, not dialysis, the whole methodology of treatment itself changes. The methodology that we'll have to contact a doctor, we'll have to work with the doctor to work for the hormone replacement therapy, or they look at a lot of other factors. If first, they look at, you know, if they can be uh, treated with certain medications and along with medication, if then, if, uh, you know, a diet can be given. Go to the next slide. Now, factors to consider to drive a report. Now, first, we check at the profile of the client, family tree and lifestyle. These are very important. Go to the next one. I'm, I've just got a case for you here. Now assume that, you know, a person has, for personal details, this is all we take. Their eating habits, their height, weight, that will determine their BMI and BMR. That is for you people to look at. And then the lifestyle, their physical activity, their current diet, if they are consuming alcohol and smoking. Can you go to the next one? But out of all of this, you know, there is one more thing that, that took, that took by a surprise, that there is something called genotype. So there are three factors that we discussed. One is the, you know, the factor that is important for their genetic. Next is the epigenomics. Third is the genotype. How does a genotype even differ? Can you go to the 
uh, second video, the genetic drift. So this is what I was talking about, you know, how their, when the drift happens, how their genetic actually changes. So you got an idea, right? When a person, a left-handed person, moved to four people, just moved to another place, they are bound to go through certain genetic changes because of the lifestyle, their uh, diet, and everything else. And then remaining people, you know, you know, in some places we hear that you know there are hardly any people with diabetes, there are hardly any people with obesity. This is one of the one of the reasons also the natural cal calamities has been a boon to them. You know, most of the deceased people, when they pass away through a natural calamity, the healthy people stayed back and they don't have any descendants to, uh, you know, to carry that unhealthy genes forward. And the ones that moved away, they're carrying. So genes are important, but when you carry over, but the change that would definitely happen is the epigenomics based on the lifestyle and their current place that they're living. So this is something all of you would have done in your... Uh, you know, second PU about how a dominant and resistant genes and what kind of eye color. You can go to the next one. Now, this is important. Now, when we talk about the most prevailing disease today is cancer. Now, when it comes to cancer, always check their genetic report from fourth generation because some of them would go to a very submissive genes. So, when a person, you know, a very healthy lifestyle, he has the most, he walks every day, he eats healthy food, has been, has not smoked and never drank alcohol, but still got cancer. We hear such cases and they are the most common ones that at least I have seen. So that is when we go to the genetic report, minimum two, three generations back and we look at their, you know, we try to get their data as much as possible and see what exactly they have done. But then just to give you an example, you know, for example, when you see the yellow color ones are the ones with the genetic cancer and that is carried. So as you see the descendants, most of them have cancer here. It might be, you know, the, uh, you know, it might be that it, it's a suppressive gene. But whenever we get a genetic report, we've got to tell them that, you know, it might be a suppressive gene in your case, but it might pass, pass on to your next generation. So based on that, make the ch changes of your lifestyle for your child and for yourself. So that is where genetic report mostly helps. So the ones that are in view are already diagnosed with cancer. 
So we know that they are already going through some kind of treatment. But the most dangerous ones are the ones that are in the yellow color here. So whenever we get a client, we draw a map like this with every client we get. If they get the genetic report and we see the risk of cancer or anything that is very rare, we definitely go back and we try to draw the map at least for three generations before to understand where it has come from and how many generations more it is going to continue. So we have a research team of nutritionists who do this for us. They are taught as a part of the training. Can go to the next one. Now, yeah, now these are the actual definitions, you know, just to help you people. So basically, eventually, what does nutrigenomics also do? We basically help them to follow a correct lifestyle and stay away from certain disorders that can come in future. But there is one you know, problem that we always face with the genetic report. Whenever they see the genetic report, they see high risk for so many factors, right? They definitely get scared. So it is up to the up to us, the nutritionists, to tell them how to manage it. So we should not only behave like only, you know, get just give them the nutrition chart and finish there. We should be as counselors. You know, off late online counselings are very famous. So you know, online counseling is something that all of you can start practicing from now on because online counseling can be a great impact also. That's what we have realized because you don't see the person. They only hear your voice and they only hear the motivation that you can give them. So just make sure whenever you're talking to the client, if they see the risk report, make sure you give them a lot of motivation. So also behave like a psychologist. Don't just end at, you know, you have the risk of this, follow this diet, don't end there. Make sure the follow-up sessions also include a lot of, uh, you know, motivation for them to come over the risk that they look into their report. You know, what we have also observed is um, when they see the risk report for their children. So for children, you know, the risk of autism, ADHD has increased a lot. So though it was not there, at least in the last four or five years, right now, in whichever report, children report that we see, we see a lot, we see a lot of ADHD and autism. So we want to make sure that, you know, parents need more counseling than children when it comes to the genetic risk of all of this. Now, this is a small report that I got for you people. Now here, this is how a genetic report looks. This is from one of the companies. Now the father has certain disorders, okay, and then he's managing it based uh, you know, with the dietary changes and lifestyle changes. Mother, no condition, but maternal grandfather, you can see type 2 diabetes, died of heart attack at the age of 45, a very early death. What we see today, you know, from the age of 40, 45, 25, 30, we see a sudden death of cardiac attack. So this is taken from one of those, those reports. And then maternal grandmother had type 2 diabetes, was under dialysis, and then currently 60 years, still alive, for example. And then paternal type 2, again died of cardiac arrest. So when anybody gets this report, right, the first thing that you'll have to tell that person is, stay physically active, stay away from fatty foods, because you have a very high risk of cardiac arrest at a very young age. If you see from both the grandfathers, he was suddenly died of heart attack at a pretty young age. And then paternal grandmother also with dialysis. So there are two cases that we are looking at dialysis, a kidney disorder plus a heart attack. Now these are the main two risk factors that you are going to highlight for this person. Okay, and then based on that, the diet is going to be planned. And then siblings and children, as of now, no medical history reported. Assuming that this person is around 30, 35 years, this is what the report says. Now after this, we are going to look at all the gene expressions that I showed you in the previous slide. We are going to look at all the gene expressions and then based on that, a nutrition plan will be given. Now this is how a post counseling report looks. So generally a genetic company, right, when they want to give out the report, uh, they give out the whole lot of report of all the disorders, around 60 to 65. But what we will do is, we are going to take the ones that are for high risk first. Now, along with the previous slide that we saw for paternal grandmother, grandfather, everything. Now, that is the first set of report that you people are going to prepare. 
the second set is going to come from this. So where you know the person has a risk for thyroid cancer and spondylitis, skin aging, cell renal cell sarcinoma that is nothing but uh, kidney cancer. And then there is a high risk for B12 deficiency. There is a bladder cancer that we can see and lactose intolerance. So this is the second set of report that you people have to prepare based on the risk. Go to the next one. Now I have just taken one of the conditions, the skin aging. Uh, now, see there is one thing here. Whenever the genetic report comes to us, right, the client will choose what they want. Most of the companies also give this option. They don't always say this is the exact diet you need to follow. Assuming, you know, for example, we had a client who was, uh, you know, um, traveling 25 days in a month. So when I give him a very, very strict diet or even a diet that uh, that is not possible. So we would give the option to the client, okay, about which one you want to choose first. For example, here, if the client has used, uh, you know, want to use skin aging as their first option, then we'll go ahead with that. The current genetic report has an advantage because they would tell you at what age it would start. For example, if there is a renal uh, you know, carcinoma that we saw, at what age it is going to start is something that they will give. Now, for example, the client is 30, then they will say start looking at this particular risk uh, post 40. Okay. Then we are going to make that list from post 35, start looking at the symptoms and what kind of diet you have to follow. So basically, we are going to give them a diet plan or a nutrition plan for almost 20 years because we have their whole genetic data with us. So wherever they go, whichever country they move, whichever nutritionist they contact, your notes based on the genetic report is very, very important. And make sure you talk to the next nutritionist, when whomever they are consulting, because we are all in the same field, we have to encourage each other, there is no competition. Always make sure that you talk to the nutritionist, show them this report on what basis you made the analysis and report was given. So skin aging is one and here we, here we have just mentioned food because this is easy for the client but before this, you know, a nutritionist will get the report of compound level which is a new thing. So when you people would join work, you are going to get a compound level information, not the food level information. The companies have moved to a level of nutri uh, you know, nutrients. For example, they don't mention berries, tomato, beetroot. They are going to mention lycopene there. They are not going to mention tomatoes. Uh, you know, based on the kidney, you have to again remove tomato from the uh, list. That, that is a research that I'm working on with a couple of companies where we are going to only encourage them to put compound level information. And based on the risk, you can remove the foods. Go to the next one. Now, this is for colorectal cancer, this, the, which, you know, the risk came very high. Now, the, there is a small thing called assessment which says medium risk. You know why we have given that based on the age. Currently, this person has a medium risk for colorectal uh, cancer. So, here, you know, what should you watch for? Now, this is what we are going to give it to the client. Blood in the stool, stomach cramps, unexplained weight loss, weakness, fatigue, persistent change in the bowel habits, change in the consistency of foods. Now, these are the things that we are going to tell the client to watch for. Any one of the symptom comes up, please contact your nutritionist. Make sure you start that kind of diet. Contact your doctor. Take all the necessary steps. Even before, you know, don't wait till the cancer actually is in, in a very high stage. You know, get rectified even when it is in the starting stages. That way, we will be able to help them much easier. Go to the next one. Now here again, lactose intolerance, most common, lactose intolerance, gluten, all this has become very common. And there is also a research says none of us are actually prone to, uh, you know, we, are, we can digest lactose. That is a huge study the Human Genome Project has taken. Especially Indians, we can't digest lactose. But as we all know, I don't know, for three generations we've been drinking milk. In fact, that is apparently one of the reasons that we have ended up with so many cancers and, you know, diabetes, cholesterol risk. But however, you know, when a client comes and the client has been drinking milk for their lifetime, we can't ask them to avoid. So we put them at a medium risk. We look at the, we ask them to watch at the symptoms. 
you know, if you get sudden abdominal cramps, bloating, flatulence, diarrhea, right after you consume any of the milk products. And that is when we are going to reach out, you know, make sure you avoid milk and milk product for few days. Let's go to the next one. Now, this is basically for, uh, you know, interpretation and this will be given to the client. Now, whenever the vitamin C, you know, it has, there is, there is a risk for vitamin C. In the whole genetic report, there are going to be 20 to 25 nutrients. 20 to 25 nutrients that might have high risk, moderate risk, risk and low risk. So based on that, we are going to give them a report like this, which is going to help them to increase. So what is the nutrition interpretation? But because you know, they need it in the higher level. So you see a nutrition interpretation here and there is a higher level. So these people fall under the category of higher level because they are constantly prone to lowering with these vitamins. Sometimes they go through hair fall, they go, they go through depression, they have no idea what they are going through. It will be something coming from the micronutrients. I think most of them, you know, we are always, whenever we plan a diet chart, we are always busy dividing the carbs, protein, fat. Why you do that, please also look at their micronutrient intake. How much of fruits, vegetables, you know, that they are consuming, dry fruits, nuts, at what quantity and at what time they are consuming. That is very important. And based on that, a nutrition interpretation is something that we get from the RDI data. But the higher level, the TUL value is what we need to interpret and give it to them. Next one. Now, the ones that are yellow, we give them a diet chart. The diet chart has not changed. It is still the same. That is not uh, something different. But what we do is we mark them the food based on their um, our genomics, how to plan their diet. Now, the ones that are marked in yellow, that is going to help them to manage their different disorders and also their current issue. For example, if they have come with us with, with some skin disorder, along with that, uh, your risk, all of that, based on all of that, a diet chart is prepared. And we go mark them and tell them that this is something that you have to make sure that you follow. No, you know, you, there are no compromises there. Now, what happens when you become a neutral genomic expert? Now, I'm sure you went through the whole slide and whenever you join the company, a proper training will be given for you to go through each factor. But one thing is, it is definitely a, you know, a great learning curve. The learning curve versus a normal nutritionist who will just look at BMI, BMR and look at the blood report and give versus when you look at a nutrigenomic report, you exactly know what to tackle. What are the risks from which this, from which the problem is arised? Which is the actual gene which is contributing for this problem? That is what we will be looking at. And the future are definitely promising and the openings are very high because uh, at least I have seen, you know, when, we, when I started my nutrigenomic training, there were only a couple of companies who would do that. But today I see... You know, between Bangalore, Hyderabad, Pune and Mumbai, there are, in each state, I see minimum 15 to 20 companies that are only doing the genetic test. The famous nutritionists, uh, you know, they also get their genetic test for their client. To even, they don't even look at their BMI, BMR now. They directly get into the genetic testing. They see what is affecting the factor and then they go ahead. Most of the sports people, they get the genetic testing done. Because sports nutrition itself is a big thing right now. So based on the, you know, if now there is one, uh, you know, side of report which talks about if the person is a morning person or an evening person. Now what does that mean? Should this person uh, exercise in the morning or evening? And based on that, a diet can be planned and his, uh, you know, fitness can be planned based on that. So along with this, you know, along with nutrigenomics course, a sports nutrition course or a gut health course, Anything like that definitely is going to help you for a very bright future. Now, pay has definitely improved. Uh, it is not like before. Of course, I don't know much about the hospital pay right now, but otherwise the pay is pretty promising because there is a lot of analysis that gets through. Um, okay, I think I'm good. Do you have any questions to ask?
no questions so i can ask you all questions then about the genomics now yeah no questions at all okay i think no questions there Yes, yes, there are. There are a few institutions that do give nutrigenomics course. Uh, the, there is one institute called Nutrigenetics. That is an online course that you can get enrolled. In fact, for students, uh, there's a lot of discount. So you can look at that factor. But there's also a company in Mumbai that will give a, um, a integrated course of nutrition and gut health. That is something that you can definitely look at because gut health is also coming in a big way. Along with nutrition, when you club it with anything else, that is going to be very good. Like sports nutrition or gut health. It, the, the future and the aspects that you look at is very bright. But nutrigenetics is something that you can definitely look at because I know for students she has a great discount and everything. Thank you. Okay, sure. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, ma'am, for taking the time to speak at our event. Your insights and perspective were truly valuable, and we were all thoroughly engaged by your session. It was a pleasure to have you with us, and we hope you enjoyed the experience as much as we did, ma'am. Your passion really came through in your words, and we are all very grateful for the knowledge and inspiration you have shared with us. Your contribution to the event was invaluable, and we could not have asked for a more engaging and informative speaker. Again, thank you, ma'am, for your time and sharing your expertise with us. I now call Ms. Aisha Rabani to propose the vote of thanks. Uh, thank you so much, ma'am, uh, for this wonderful session. Uh, the essence of all beautiful and great artists' gratitude. I uh, deem it a great honor and privilege to propose a word of thanks to you, especially uh, on this memorable occasion of national webinar on the nutrigenomics, which was a blended mode. Uh, I express my gratitude on the behalf of management, staff, and students of St. Anne's College for Women. Um, a very hearty vote of thanks to our beloved speaker, Ms. Uh, Sindhu Ashwin Ma'am, uh, for gracing their uh, important work and sharing an immense knowledge in uh, neutral genomics. As Ma'am said about the genotype, especially she has enlightened what exactly neutral genomics is and how it involves the working of phenotype in it and uh, especially what we all were waiting, the career options in this. So thank you so much, Ma'am, for giving uh, the knowledge to all of us on this important uh, topic. And uh, we all were inspired by your great words. I would like to extend our uh, deep sense of gratitude to faculty for joining us and making the session more beautiful and lively. Uh, my heartfelt thanks to the colleagues, the organizing committee for their valuable contribution, guidance and encouragement in all their efforts. Then I extend the thanks to the team members for organizing and making it a resounding uh, event. Last but never the least, the most important and a deep hearty thanks to all the dear students the volunteers for their enthusiasm, relentless efforts, dedication, and making this event a resounding success. So once again, thank you all of you for being present here this morning, and it's a great pleasure for all of us. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, Aisha. 
I now request everyone to please stand up for the national anthem. Thank you. 